Welcome to the official podcast of Comics Beer and Sci-Fi. Before we get started, make sure to subscribe to this podcast and follow Comics Beer and Sci-Fi on all your favorite social media apps. Now, on with the show! Hey, this is Mark at Motor City Nightmares. I'm here with Dave Sheridan. You might recognize him from Scary Movie as Doofy. Or maybe uh, Ghost World as the nunchuck wheeling uh, convenience store. Come here, dude. Who else? Learn learn the rules. Ray Dobson, the nurse from Calcutta. Have you guys seen that one? No? Oh, no. Okay. You've got to work with some pretty cool directors. Keenan Ivory Waynes, yeah, yeah. Uh, Terry Zygoff, yeah, Zygoff, and yep. Rob Zombie. Tell yep. me, what was your experience when you first started working in these movies? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the really first experience I learned is, like, these directors are full of shit. They don't know anything. And they're lucky that I came on and fixed all their films, the ones you just named. Uh, and I'm not going to pull punches here. And if you've got a problem, and I'm going to say something to Rob Zombie out there, I will meet you in the ring anytime, anytime in the ring. Keenan Ivory Wayne's, no, I got, I'm, you know, I know you do the MMA fighting and Terry's wipe off, two hands tied behind my back. I hear, you know, you got problems with me, fuck off. Is that, oh, is that this? That's not this interview. Oh, I thought we were a wrestling thing. Uh, no, it's been awesome, dude. I love, I love filmmaking. I've been doing it since I was like five years old and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's better than working a regular job. I can't work a regular job. Do you see who I am? I'm freaking nuts. I'd be fired out of any, I'd be fired off of your job thing, and it's like, you're, you're barely real. You know what I mean? It's like, you could set, not mean like, you could set your own hours and stuff. I'm, can you imagine me, like, delivering for UPS or something, right? Crazy. Now, with Scary Movie, did you ever, after the movie came out, did you ever get any feedback or meet David Arquette about, I, about I, your character interpretation? Yes, several times, several times. I actually just told somebody the first, the first time I met him. I actually lived next door to him in L.A. prior to the scary movie on Gower Street. Uh, and, uh, but I didn't actually meet him. He'd come and go. I just rented a house next to his family's home. And, uh, but then I went to, I was invited to a premiere of Tripper, which is a movie he directed. I'm not, I think he might have wrote it and directed it, and uh, Paul Rubens is in it. If you haven't seen Tripper, it's, I love the film. It's a horror movie. It's uh, set in 1982. Ronald Reagan character is the main killer, and it's like the anti-drug, don't do drugs. And Paul Rubens is like a, um, what is that? Uh, what is that, that? That festival, the music festival in the 60s. Woodstock. Woodstock. It's like a Woodstock thing. It's out in the woods, but somebody doses the water with acid, so everyone's tripping out, which is why it's called Tripper, and then the Ronald Reagan character is killing everybody, and Paul Rubens is trying to escape with the money. And uh, it's a great performance by Paul Rubens. It's a really great movie. We're here at a horror convention. I, I've never once seen anybody with the Tripper stuff, and I've done conventions with David Arquette. So here's like a photo of... We did a little photo op of him and I, and um, I tell him how much I love that movie. It's great that he's got a great sense of humor about it. Yeah, you don't have a career like this without having a sense of humor. Oh, you're talking about him? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Him too, though. Yeah, no, and so, but I would say this. He was on the red carpet. He's wearing this white suit, and it's splattered in blood. He was like in this, and he was so kind. he He was greeting everybody on the red carpet that was coming to the movie. And then he sees me. And I just come up to him, I go, hey, Dave, um, and before I even got my name out, he just went, I know who you are. I know who you are. And I go, oh, okay. And, he, and then we turned for the photo. He's like, ah, ah, bye-bye. And I was like, maybe he's upset, like, that he thought I was mocking him or playing him. But I'm going to let you know that Doofy was a character named Chip that was a part of a film that I shot called America Chameleon, with, which is an anthology of my characters, short films. And Miramax saw this tape would rotate around back then it was vhs tapes and it would just get dubbed and dubbed and dubbed and um they saw that and said hey that's our doofy we could just have that guy play this character chip so that's that's where it all came from i wasn't making fun of david arquette i was just playing my character that existed for about 10 years before so you went from a parody of a horror movie to a serious horror movie the devil's rejects how did you end up getting that gig Okay, so I did, I, I think that one directly came out of um, some Red Hot Chili Peppers music videos that I did, where I played the cab driver, and Rob saw those music videos, and he was like, oh, I, I like that guy, 
and then maybe saw Ghost World, and then they said, oh, it's a guy from Scary Movie. And, oh, okay, like, let me have a meeting with him, and then that was it. And Rob was really putting together one of the best pound-for-pound casts outside of a Quentin Tarantino movie. You know, uh, what was that one Quentin Tarantino movie? Uh, with yeah, yeah, that one. Like, I, I would put Devil's Rejects up there with Pulp Fiction on who's got the better ensemble yeah, cast. That was one of Tarantino's favorite movies of that year. Was it 2009 it came out? Devil's Rejects? 2005. 2005. Okay. 2005. It was one of his favorite movies. I remember seeing that in a podcast. That's I thought that was pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. I'm just glad. I know it was like a, in lineage with House of a Thousand Corpses, but it was we set this in the 70s, and it was more like, you know, uh, uh, Peck and Paul. Like, it was more like just that gritty and the car kind of stuff that used I, to happen. I called it a slasher road trip. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, it, it, like, it reminded me more of like a... Uh, Dirty Mary and Crazy Harry, that uh, Peter Fonda movie a little I think bit. That's why you know? Tarantino liked it so much because it yeah. reminded me a lot of that Grindhouse stuff that he exactly. really adored. Yeah, that one Grindhouse, the 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 Death Car, or whatever death proof has a lot of that in it. You know what I mean? That same kind of stuff. Yeah. So how did uh, Terry Zygoff find you to do that part? In it's one of the most memorable parts in in Ghost World. It's the same thing. It was off that tape called American Chameleon. And in, on that tape, the character's name was Stuart. And uh, th- they just happened upon that tape years before we made we shot the film. And I had meetings with them up in, uh, we just hung out up in San Francisco and stuff like that. I think it was through his uh, wife, Missy, who was friends with the band, the Dwarves. And those tapes, because back then, you have to understand, there was no YouTube. So I found out the way it was really spreading around the country was it was getting to like sort of punk rock bands and like touring bands and they were like watching it on the road and, and turning other bands onto it and turning other people in each city because they were like, hey, let's watch this tape, you know? And then, oh, can you make me a dub of that? And then it just got spread that way. So it's kind of interesting that music bands actually helped spread it out and really got it noticed. And so they noticed it and called me and then, then when they were making that movie, they. They gave me a call saying, hey, are you available on this day? Come up and play that character. So You, you, you do all these different characters, and uh, did you ever try out for Saturday Night Live? No, and the reason I never tried out for Saturday Night Live was I actually worked. Was Saturday Night Live was my first job out of college. I was a, a writer's assistant for the Weekend Update, and it was Kevin Nealon's first year. And so I was working, and I was doing stand-up, and Adam Sandler would take me out and couple times in front of him and Chris Rock took me out um, and gave me some minutes and I kind of sucked kind of I was kind of terrible at stand-up and we were talking about it and Chris Farley was like well what do you do and I was like oh I do these characters and I do commercial parodies and sitcom parodies and stuff like that and he's like uh, you know it's like sketch stuff and he's like it sounds like you would do better at Second City in Chicago and I knew SCTV but I didn't really know what the theater part was about I didn't actually know I knew they were all from this theater but I didn't know what it was about and he made a phone call to this woman named Joyce Sloan and I was her last hire before she retired and the best part was I was hired in May and I on the phone with her I go well you know uh and she goes come on out come on out and I was like uh well I want to like I I was in this I'm I'm a surfer and I was like yeah I was thinking of going like chill for the summer because we just finished Saturday Night Live it ends in May and uh, I'm like, so she said, yeah, go take the summer off and come in September. But in between that, in June, she retired. So I show up in September, and they're like, who are you? What? Yeah, Joyce hired me. Joyce doesn't even work here anymore. You know, she retired. She did work there still. Like, she was one of the founders, so, like, they gave her an office. But she never really showed up in the office. And, and then I, they go, what do, we want me, what do you want to do with that guy? And she's like, oh, just send him down to my office and just have him, like, help me out, you know? And so I had this giant corner office, the biggest office that people were in, a Saturday Night Live jacket. And they're like, who is this asshole? Well, you know, and that was like Steve Carell, Steve Colbert, Amy Sedaris, Dave Pasquese, just like heavy hitters, you know? Um, Yeah, it was was fun. So then, and so you asked me why I didn't audition for Saturday Night Live. I I probably would have, but I was there for two years trying to build myself up, and I got a deal at MTV to create my own show called buzzkill and i went and took that you know so at the same time i probably would have been hesitant already 
working at SNL and seeing how it sort of everything went down, how it, how it worked and the creativity and the stifling of creativity, but more so ownership of characters. After I was there the year that they shot Wayne's World and it blew up. And that's when uh, Lauren started changing the contracts of like he, anything you do on that show, he owns forever. Like, I, And I was like, well, then I'll go there and I won't do my best characters because I wouldn't want him to own it. So that was probably like a done deal going, eh, I don't need him. And I, I'm going to tell you something to the kids out there watching. I don't go back. I step forward, you know. And maybe you should think about the steps forward, otherwise you end up in a place like this. But I'm happy with what I, where I am, you know what I mean? I always say, it doesn't, don't overthink taking a left turn or the right turn because, you know, your fate and destiny is always in front of you. So how do you like coming here to these shows, meeting your fans? I love it. I love it. It's tiring. It's tiring. <laughs> I wish it wasn't. It's like you got to get up at 8 and you're not done till 9 o'clock. It's like a full day of work. So I do wish, like, I want to do, like, I, I want to get to the point where it's like Dave Sheridan, Saturday only, 2 to 4 p.m., you know what I mean? Just come in and bust them out. Two to four, I'm out of here. You know what I mean? Because it's a long time. That's it. You know, it's long. What do you got coming down the pipeline? This is a movie called Stream, and it's very similar to a Devil's Rejects level cast. I mean, Bill Mosley's in it, Tony Todd, Daniel Harris, Jeffrey Combs, D. Wallace, Felissa Rose, myself, Daniel Roebuck, Tim Curry's possible last movie, spoiler alert, and, and a whole bunch of other actors in it. It's a great cast, and it's made by the team that did the Terror Fire 1, 2, and 3. Damien Leone does all the kills, and I'm not going to tell you what happens to me, but you know, let's just say it's as bloody as those Terror Fire movies. Uh, Dave, we look forward to checking that out. And yeah. this is Mark at Motor City Nightmares with Dave Sheridan. Hey everyone, it's Nick with Comic Experience Sci-Fi. I'm at Motor City Nightmares 2024, and I got a real treat for you guys. Uh, a lot of you know the Ed and Lorraine Warren uh, personalities from the Conjuring films. The two main characters are Ed and Lorraine Warren, and they are demonologists, and they help families who are under uh, demonic oppression, possession. But actually, I got into Ed and Lorraine Warren back in the late 80s through a book called The Demonologist that chronicled several of their cases, including the original Annabelle case, which is terrifying. Well, I'm here with Jason McLeod. He's a writer, he's a demonologist himself, and he actually worked with Ed and Lorraine Warren and apprenticed with them, and actually came to them through the exact same book, The Demonologist. So right. Jason, tell us what led you to The Demonologist and then take it from there. So I was always interested in ghosts as a young man. I was always in the library studying cases about spirit phenomena. And as a senior in high school in Westport, Connecticut, 1986, I pulled off the book, The Demonologist, off the shelf. And it scared the hell out of me for the families that were enduring this type of activity, especially the children, because no child should have to endure the horrors that they went through in their own home. And I put the book back on the shelf. I was with my friend Lou four years later, who was an Army combat medic and a current paramedic. And we were listening to the radio about a case about the Warrens. And I said, that'd be so cool to work with them. And he said, yeah, no kidding. Big burly dude, right? Mustache. The next night, he called me and said, you aren't going to believe who just called me. Who? Ed Warren. I'm like, what? Right? Ed was having heart issues at the time. He wanted a medic for their team. So Norwalk was the nearest major EMS hub. Asked the chief of EMS for a referral. He gave him Lou's phone number. And he invited him to their Monday night class that next night. And I said, you have to get me in there. It's time. Now, it wasn't time four years prior, right? But I call that the universal law of intention. That'd be so cool to work with them. Yeah, no kidding, right? And then the universal law of conscious manifestation and boom, okay? So he told Lorraine all about the synchronicity. Not coincidence, but synchronicity there. That'd be so cool to work with them. Yeah, no kidding, right? And then the phone call. So she said, okay, invite Jason next Monday night. So I got to go the next Monday night and open the door. This uh, Drew Thompson, who's a friend of mine to this day, he's a psychic. He was one of the original Warren investigators, invited me in. Lorraine's in the distance and comes, up to, comes literally gliding up to me. Hi, Jason. I'm Lorraine Warren, honey. You know, how strong is your faith, honey, was the first question she asked me, right? And I said, I have immense faith. I believe that I and the Father are one, right, as are we all. We're all connected to the Creator. We're never separate. Why do you want to get involved in work of this nature, right? And I said, I read your book, The Demonologist. I was terrified for the children. I want to help, right? So it's a calling then, she asked me. And I said, I believe it is. Welcome aboard. So 
I got to go in, and it, it's like walking into the wizard's castle, right? This amazing, enigmatic couple. They were like the grandparents you wish you had, even though I loved my grandparents dearly. They were like so incredible. And we, I got to go into the class, right? And in walks Ed in his flannel shirt, you know, pulls down the view screen, the video screen, and starts uh, talking about the current cases they're investigating. And they talked about a case that, a brand new case that became, they became aware of. <clears throat> they sent Lou and I on that case. This is his second class. This is my first class. The next evening, representing them. And I'm like, what? Right? So I wrote about that. I was a student at Sacred Heart University, and I wrote a newspaper column called Hauntings in 1990 in November about my very first case and other cases, and that blew me away, and it scared Lou about 50% out the door, and I was completely hooked. What did you experience when you went there? Oh, wow. Okay, so it was a family, a husband and wife, and a newborn. They bought a used home. They claimed every evening a spirit or an apparition would walk through their bedroom wall, ignore them completely, walk down the hallway to the baby's room where the crib was, stop in front of the crib, scare the baby out of its wits, walk through the crib and disappear through that wall every evening. Didn't make any sense because it's a second story level, right? So I borrowed my mom's camcorder, 1986, right? Bought a tripod, put some candles in the room, drew the blinds so there's just a little bit of illumination and we all waited in the baby's room waiting to see this apparition walk down the hallway. We all heard a clack noise and a bright blue flash of light in that bedroom across the hall like lightning had gone off in there. That's how bright it was. We all just looked at each other like, oh my God, that's gonna, we're gonna get the best footage ever in our first case, but is that the doorway opening? Is that the door, the portal, the stargate, the wormhole? Is she going to come walking down the hallway? Let's wait and see, and nothing happened. Upon re-entering the room, we all smelled a very potent uh, almond smell, like a, like a perfumed almond smell, and nothing else. And we retreated back into the baby's room, and exactly 30 minutes later, another crack of light, another, uh, another crack, another flash of light, and upon re-entering the room, the smell, all of which were about 50% diminished. And after nothing happened for the remainder of the evening, we were gravely disappointed we get to, didn't get to see a spirit. We wanted to see what we got on that tape. So we put it in our VHR machine, and we fast forward and hit play at the same time. You know, you see the, the, the fast forwarding and the lights flickering, the candles. And when we stopped, we heard, we've just experienced the second flash of light. There was nothing at all. No increase in illumination at all on the tape, but Lou picked up a heartbeat. That's a diarthritic heartbeat. I think that's the correct name. He, did, he, just, he detected three different heartbeats, one after the other. He was white as a ghost. Now, the camcorder was never sensitive enough to pick up somebody's heartbeat, nor was anybody standing in there when it picked up the heartbeat, right? We didn't know what to make of it. So I dropped the tape off to the Warren's house the next day, and upon the next class, we got to listen to what was going on, and Lorraine told us that this woman obviously was there, but she wasn't going to give us an apparition mess, uh, image, but she projected that light into our third eyes. Our pineal glands, which are photosensitive, it has rods and cones, it's how we see full color dreams in a pitch black room with our eyes closed, right? It's how we daydream and see movies in our head, it's our interdimensional interface. So she projected that light, and also the smell, because there was no physical presence creating a scent or a light or a heartbeat, but the heartbeat was projected onto the tape where the, where the light and the scent could not be. Fascinating. But she always said, all hauntings begin in the mind, right? So if you're sitting in your home alone and you know no one is upstairs, but you hear creaking floorboards happening, there's no physical weight being applied to those floorboards. So how is this possible? It's because the spirit that's in the house is projecting what the sound of creaking floorboards would sound like to get your attention, right? This was an earthbound human spirit. It was a female. I was say, there's no and for, evidence. No, no. For, no. Is, yeah. for whatever reason, she was present in that house, and she was giving the couple evidence that she was there, but wouldn't give it to us, which was strange. But she, the Lou was scared about 50% out the door at that point because he could deal with physical horrors, but not supernatural stuff, you know? And again, he had no interest in this um, previously, but I did. 
but he was called in as a medic, right? So he really was supposed to be there to help Ed deal with potential heart issues during the really hairy cases that they were on, because they only got involved personally in the really severe cases. They sent us investigators, about 12 of us or so in the whole group, New England Society for Psychic Research, uh, on the minor cases that involved something that wasn't too serious. But they got involved personally when it was really bad, and Ed was having heart issues, you know? Jason, uh, I I'm sure you're familiar with the name of Stephen Kaplan. No. Stephen Kaplan wrote a book uh, attacking the Warrens and debunking the Amityville horror. Now, now does that ring a bell? So, uh, so, so was the Amityville horror authentic? I wasn't there. I can't even talk about it. You know, but, but, she, but Lorraine and Ed swear. They swear it was. Okay. You know. So I, be, I here's the thing. They've gotten a lot of negative press. I came in in 1990, so I can really only talk about the cases that I was personally investigated, uh, involved in. I do know Carmen Snedeker personally, who was the haunting in Connecticut principal. In fact, she reviewed my book. And the problem is, is that Hollywood, when they sold their rights, Hollywood can do what they will with any of the material since they bought the rights. So they'll, in a haunting in Connecticut, there are no bodies in the walls, you know, that they put in there. And Carmen was upset about that because it makes the makes her case look foolish, makes the Warrens look suspicious, right? Because none of that really happened. So people, I mean, if you look at these these stand-ups. Half of the people don't even know what the Warrens really looked like. They know that Vera and whatever the other actor is that played the guy. Sorry, guy. If, I, if you're listening to this, I don't know what your name is. Um, good acting, though. Um, the Warrens were very genuine, serious people. And Lorraine's, um, they were like the grandparents you wish you had. And Lorraine was always very seriously concerned about the safety of the investigators. Again, very serious cases. And Ed was always very serious, always cracking jokes, trying to raise the vibration because everything is frequency and vibration. Love is the highest, fear is the lowest, right? And a lot of these situations are bad. So as far as the Amityville case, I can't comment. As far as the, you know, the Enfield case in, uh, as in the demonologist and the Enfield voices and things like that, they have stuff on audio, right? So I know that the cases that I worked on with them, in fact, I'm writing a full-length novel about a case in Vermont that we investigated together. I have the audio from that case, which I now showcase at a lot of these conventions where everybody's freaked out of their minds. Lorraine almost called the case off before we ever even went there because I almost lost my life on the way to getting to the warrants to pick them up. That's a mind blower right there. And they realize that something was trying to prevent us from getting there. So my story is, if you have time, sure. I was, I got up, I offered to drive my mother's brand new caravan to pick Lorraine and Ed up and several other investigators as one of the vehicles that we were gonna use. I got in the car first thing in the morning, Saturday morning, woke up, got in the car, put my hands on the wheel and was guided to do something I'd never done before. And I said, I washed this car in the blood of Jesus Christ, that we are protected. Right? We arrive safely and return safely in Jesus' name, amen. And I said, that was weird, right? I've never done that before. And it wasn't really purported to be a very dangerous case, even though the family had fled, right, up in Vermont. I got on the Merritt Parkway in Connecticut. It's a two-lane road north, two-lane road south, beautiful median in the between. I'm in the left lane going, you know, the speed limit. I look in my rearview mirror and there's a car that's whipping up behind me and said, okay, Saturday morning, 6 a.m. in the morning, he's gonna blow by me and that's that. Raced up, matched my speed and, and remained parallel with me. And I'm like, what the heck, right? Black BMW, right? And I speed up, slow down, he speeds up, slows down. And I didn't even look to see who it was. I couldn't tell who it was, but I was just focused on driving. I was a young guy at the time. I didn't want to wreck my mother's car. And all of a sudden, that car did a, like it leapt a car length ahead of me, right? Just like, boosh, right? And I was like, what in the hell? Then it starts to vibrate. As I'm watching, it's vibrating. It starts to shake like this. Starts to fishtail and white smoke's coming out from underneath the wheels. Fishtail, whoop, right into my lane, 90 degree angle. I hit the brakes, plowed right into him, blasted his windows out, the state police came. He said it's like I hit solid ice, right? The state police, it's November 30th, there's no ice, but it was, you know, they, so he got the ticket. There were no cell phones. So by the time I got cleared to go 45 minutes later, I got to the pay phone on exit 44 in Fairfield and called the Warrens and I explained I was just involved in an accident. I'm sorry I'm late. There was a long pause. Tell me exactly what happened was Lorraine's voice, right? And I explained it. 
and I heard them talking, in the, in the, are you still willing to come? And I said, yeah, the van's drivable. I'm a little shaken up, but I'm okay, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm eager to participate in this case you know, with them. And so I got there. John Zaffis is looking at his watch going, you know, what would you do over sleep, you know, and things like that. Walk inside. And Lorraine almost called the entire case off because something took control of that black BMW and flung it into my lane to prevent me from picking them up and then thus preventing us from getting there. But had I not prayed over that van, we all have the power to do that. I believe I could have been seriously hurt or worse, right? But she realized there's a force there, that a demonic force, because no human spirit can take control of a car, uh, prevent us from getting up there. And that was a mind bender. That case, I had my first deeply powerful empathic experience up there. It was my first genuine psychic experience other than the blue light. And that changed my life because I said, I want to be able to see, you know, I want to see because Lorraine was seeing the spirit in the, in the house with a black top hat. So was Drew, the psychic. The table shaking, Ed's trying to initiate contact. You hear my voice go, Lorraine, the sadness and literally bawled my eyes out. I could not stop the tears from streaming out of my eyes. I felt a sadness like I could never, I've never felt before. And it was the sadness or the grief that this earthbound human spirit felt because she had lost her life in transit to the house to deliver the baby 150 years prior. And I was completely overcome. And that changed my life because to see a ghost would be really cool. But to feel the anguish that they are experiencing made me want to help them even more, right? Because that's why I got involved in the first place. And she had lost her child, of course, during that accident. And she's in search of her baby must be where's my baby where's my baby the grief i couldn't imagine the grief but now i would tell her just cross over go through the light that's where your baby's waiting for you because it never came down to fuse with the baby in the first place before birth to experience its life expression right fascinating stuff but it's all about helping people you know that's amazing uh what is the most or what are the most physical like, have you ever seen anything float or lift off a table? Yep. What are the most physical things you've seen that proved you beyond all doubt that there is spiritual energy that can control physical objects? Yep. Uh, I was in a case in Idaho. I investigated on the Warren's behalf because I was, I was in, at college at Eastern Washington. And actually, I'm writing about that now. It's called Rage in Rathrum. And I took a friend of mine who was a football player. We're both six foot six, and we went to investigate. And as we were there investigating, there was a box full of wood, big firebox, right? Made of wood itself, which is probably at least probably 75 pounds, loaded with firewood, slide right across the floor, right, with our own eyes. A rocking chair moving back and forth and so forth, lights going on and off, doors closing by themselves. And they don't really close by themselves because there is an energy projected onto them that's moving them. And nothing's really physical, as we understand physicality to be. Everything's frequency and vibration. So to us, nothing can move a physical object, but we can only see visible light, which is 1% of everything around us. Right? We're blind in these bodies. Cats and dogs can see more than we can. But that, that box easily could have weighed well over 150 pounds, and that is definitely not a human spirit that can lift only a couple pounds in weight. That was the most intense physical object, but I've seen crazy things, man. I mean, this case that I wrote about called Dark Siege, a Connecticut Family's Nightmare, that I became involved with in 1993, uh, the family was never gonna come forward about it. They were terrified of a three-peat because they came back after them a second time, including incubus and succubus attacks, which were sexual, so I had to make it a separate volume. Um, they wanted to warn people, especially children, don't mess with Ouija boards. Don't get involved in seances. Don't invite these things into your life. Don't open those doorways, right? But horrible, amazing, mind-blending things. But the thing is, just like the light was projected into our eyes, these demonic entities that came in through the use of the Ouija board and then thus being challenged projected mass projections on, a, on, on all, like six people at a time, mass hundreds or millions of flies coming out of the sink drain, right? Which wasn't physically happening, but to them it was happening, right? And the evidence disappearing before their eyes from a fly carcass, right? All of a sudden they were all dead, right? And a fly carcass turning into liquid black water in the baggie, because they wanted evidence, before their eyes, and then disappearing, the water completely evaporating until there's nothing inside the baggie again, right? 
all the organic food stuffs in the refrigerator being moved from within the refrigerator onto the floor in a flash, like they'd been sitting there for months, rotting and festering in, in absolute stink. And all of the containers within the refrigerator are cr crystal clear like they've been run through the dishwasher. A pool of urine that appeared in the spot where the boys had used the Ouija board that was so deep in the carpet that six different bath towels wouldn't even dent it. And then gone within a flash. And the towel smelling like car wax, yet all of it's there. And it's all meant to crack the psyche, to cause you to emit fear, right, which they use against you because that's their fuel source. They're extra low vibrational beings that use the fear to fuel themselves and to weaken you. Fear also makes your aura porous, as does alcohol and drugs, right? Ooh, tingles every time I talk about it, to work their way into your body and to help, you know, they don't fully possess you in that state, but their, their goal is to break you down enough that it just, oppression. And yes, absolutely. I just want to ask, Lorraine and, and Ed, of course, would say a demonic spirit is a spirit that never walked the earth in human form. What does that mean? It means that we're all fields of awareness, right? And these are beings that are preternatural in origin, that existed before humanity was ever conceived of in the, in the mind of God, if you will. They don't need a physical body to interact with this world because they operate outside the realms of physics, right? It's like the terms of service agreement. When you, you want to enter a game world, right? You have to you accept the terms of service and you're bound by those rules. They're not bound by any of these rules and they can create what we call negative miracles because it's beyond the scope of any human being, right? Meaning the power levels that they have. They don't need a body. They don't have a body. Angels and demons don't have bodies. They don't have genders. They're genitalia. Yet they'll manifest as physical forms with genitalia to go after the victims by projecting what those victims desire to work their way into their fields and then appear like they really appear, which are these horrible, awful, hags and, and, and beasts, you know, as is the case in Dark Siege 2, The Nightmare Returns. They were, two of the teenage boys that were attacked by, one was an incubus and one was a succubus attack that they got and it wrecked their lives, you know. Did, I mean, how can you not be destroyed after something like that happens or have any kind of normal relationship with anybody after you've been completely violated in that way? It's terrible, awful stuff. All because they used a Ouija board in the house to find out why an earthbound human spirit followed the six-year-old uh, sister home. Don't play with that stuff, man. It, it's, it saves all of us a bunch of work <laughs> and nightmares, you know? It's crazy. So you can find all my stuff on darksiege.com, D-A-R-K-S-I-E-G-E.com. Uh, I have an amazing event called Defeating the Demonic. It's a 10-hour live event in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I have exorcists and demonologists, they're archbishops, Bishop James Long, Bill Bean. We're showing the reality behind these cases to prove to people demons are real, right? And this is the voices and these are the videos and these are the horrific things that we experience, that they experience because they have to clean up the messes that all these paranormal groups are causing by sticking their noses into places they don't belong and by people using Ouija boards and seances and magic and voodoo and all this other stuff. Jason, I could talk to you all day, but I, we got to let you go. Thank Thanks you. so much for talking, Thank Joseph. You. Best of luck to Thank you. you. Thank you. Hey, this is Market Motor City Nightmares. I'm here with Harrison Lang. He's the owner of Static Tape Video. They have all these eclectic retro VHS tapes and beta tapes. Tell us a little, how did you get started doing this? Six years ago, I just, I was working at Family Video kind of saw where that place was going back in 2018 and just kind of I knew the renting days were done so I just kind of spent some time I already collected movies myself just kind of thought yeah, we're gonna need a store like this one day with streaming services and where they're heading I kind of knew where that was gonna go with prices going up and ads all being added and hard to find some movies and that's all where we're at now there's 30 different services and who doesn't want to go through the aisles and look at the cover art anymore you know everyone wants that type of stuff like that's awesome and six years later it just keeps getting bigger and I get all this type of stuff VHS now is huge and I'm glad I was early in that game and a lot of it's rare now I mean a lot of it probably either got destroyed from wear and tear or people just discarded them uh, and now they're they're collectors items. 
Yeah, I, everyone said it's always that magic number 30. Once something's 30 years old, it's it's collectible now. And yeah, that was very true with VHS. It's uh, now it's even their later release stuff is going pretty hot. And you know, it's it's the good stuff too. You know, it's City Living Dead, Gates of Hell. You know, the Fulci movies, which is the stuff I love. That stuff for a while was hard to find in the states. Now, now there's awesome Blu-ray even and 4K of that stuff coming out, and I like to be a hub for that type of cult and Jalo and exploitation films, as long along with the uh, the the normal awesome Terminator and retro Back to the Future type stuff as well. So, what are some of the more valuable VHS tapes you got for sale? Hard to find these big boxes. Pretty cool. I, I, I got 500 on it, and that's kind of. I'm on a bunch of Facebook groups, so it's like it's seeing what stuff goes for on those is it's insane to see. And it's like, oh, I got that. Oh my god, I can't. It's going for what? <laughs> you know? And yeah, stuff like the big box is so cool. And I mean, that cover art's just like some of the coolest stuff ever. That's always part of it. VHS home video tapes as collectibles is sort of new to the realm of collectibles now these days. Like comic books and baseball cards have been around for a while. So this is the, the, the new collectible out there. So anybody out there who has VHS tapes, you know, they might be worth some money. And you might want to come see Harrison here about getting yeah. rid of them. I'm always buying. So, yeah, if uh, you reach out anytime, find me Facebook, Instagram, and... Yeah, I, I'm traveling all around. I've been to Memphis, Wisconsin, Ohio to buy stuff. And, oh, man, I <laughs> thousands at a time before, moving trucks. It's cool. Hey, everyone. It's Nick with Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi at Motor City Nightmares 2024. I am with filmmaker C.J. Vecchio, who has, for the heck of it, with a group of filmmakers, decided to make a movie this summer, a fan film called yep. The Evil Three. Yep. And much to their uh, pleasant surprise, it's killing it at film festivals. So, CJ, tell us the story of how this came about. Basically, we're a bunch of group of us filmmakers wanted to do a fan film, right? So we're pondering, what should we do? What should we do? And there's always a Michael Myers. There's always a Jason fan film or a Leatherface. I go, listen. Let's just put all three of them into one, right? So we're like, yeah. So we got a bunch of actors, a bunch of you know local filmmakers, local actors. Uh, we got Brett Wagner, 2003 Leatherface, Elaine Dietz, she's an exorcist. So they came in and did the scenes, and we just over two weekends filmed it. We did an Indiegogo, raised about twenty-seven thousand dollars, filmed it. Uh, and just premiered two weeks ago at the Days of the Dead convention in Indianapolis. Uh, premiered, uh, showed last night, right? Nice standing ovation. And it's just been blown up in the film festivals. So we won um, Best Kill, Best Gore. Brett Wagner won Best Actor, right? And just nominated for a bunch of other ones. So it's just, we just thought we're just doing it for shits and grins on a week, you know, two weekends, and it just kind of blew up. Well, why don't you go work? I want you guys to take over Disney yeah, because they don't powerful. they don't know what they're doing with a billion dollars, yeah, and you guys yeah. raise a few grand and you kill it. Yeah. So, what's the story? What's the plot of this film? Well, you know, I really don't want to give. But basically, the deal is, um, it's all revolved around Smith's Grove Sanitarium. So we're trying to keep it the real. Everybody's like, why don't you get Freddy Krueger? I wanted to do or Dead Jason. I wanted to have it more of a realistic, real life. So basically, the gist of it, all three are at Smith's Grove Sanitarium. Due to budget cuts from Illinois, right, they're closing it down. So they had to transfer all three to a different jail, and let's just say uh, things don't go too well. So on that transfer. And that's basically just to the story. And okay. it goes a little more into it, though. But. Tell us about what it means to make a fan film. Now, you're using Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, and Leatherface on the poster. You have those characters in it. How are you able to sort of get away with that, if you will? You know, there's a bunch of legal, um, like, freedom of information, uh, not freedom of information, but free use act, right? So as long as we don't profit from it or disrespect any of the characters. I mean, there's so many fan films of Star Wars, Batman, right? So as long as you don't disrespect the character, as long as you don't profit from it, right. and you can show proof, hey, this money, you know, we're selling the DVDs, but that's going to pay off, you know, what we spent on it. And then after that, then you just throw it on YouTube for free. I mean, we can't go on Amazon or Netflix or Tubi or anything like that. Um, but like I said, after we make up our budget, what uh, other money we spent, then then we'll release it that way. So as long as you don't disrespect the character and franchise, they're, they're pretty happy with it. Did it become way better than you guys intended when you first decided yeah, to do yeah. this? Well, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we have some pretty, you know, about, I think all of us together have about about a hundred awards, right? 
amongst us uh, for films. You know, we do all originals. So, I mean, we got a pretty pro team doing this behind the scenes. We just did it for fun for two weekends, you know. Um, and like I said, just being, watching the reactions, you know. there's not. I love sitting in the back row when it's showing, and all of a sudden you see the people jumping. Or you hear the people laughing when they're supposed to laugh, sure. jump when they're supposed to jump. So that's a really good feeling. So, and then like I said, we Indianapolis, we sold out of DVDs in about 20 minutes. So we're like, all right, you know, we got something going on. That's awesome. Now tell us about the film festival that you are that you run. Yeah, well, like I said, I took over the Chicago Horror Film Festival. It's been going on for 25 years. So we took it over to, uh, uh, this is our second time. We, we ran it in October. We ran it in May. The next one's going to be uh, the last weekend of September. So we took it over, and we wanted to make it where it was a filmmaker-ran festival for filmmakers, right? I mean, most of the film festivals, it's fan-ran. And it's really, you know, the filmmakers want to have a little bit of an experience, especially for networking. So last May, we, we had to stop selling tickets a week out. We oversold. And then we had filmmakers from India fly in, Australia, London, all over the United States. Um, and like I said, we're, we had to step up to a bigger theater this year. So we're at the Logan Theater in Chicago. It's been around for like 100 years. Um, and we're, like I said, we have 500 films already submitted. So it's going to be a three-day event, uh, September 27th, 26th, 27th, and 28th, I want to say. And like I said, we're going to have pe filmmakers flying over. And we tell people that want to get in the industry, just show up, right? Because it's all about networking. Networking. Right, right. And in this business, it's who you know and that one connection. And that's what we kind of want to do. Um, you know, fans, yeah, great. Come and watch. You know, we got 300 uh, horror films, indie horror films. But like I said, for the actors or crew or somebody who wants to get into business, that's the best way to do it is networking. Having had a film in a, or having been uh, in a film festival with a screenplay where I was a finalist at, that I, Shriek Fest, you probably heard of it out, out in LA. So I went out to Shriek Fest, and one thing I did notice, everyone was very, very nice and very, very talent, very talented. I mean, everything was really impressive, but it's like we're all trying to network ourselves rather than anyone is there to be networked to. Would you say that's different at your film? Festival? I think it's different because, like I said, I mean, obviously you're going to have about, we had about 150 directors, right? right? But it's also the networking, and I'm not meant like, hey, you know, what can you do for me? It's, it's also about learning, too. Absolutely. So we had some, some impressive panels going on. Right, right. And like I said, you, I, might not, I, you know, I might know something that you don't and vice versa, and that's how you learn. And that's my main gist of it, too. You know, if you can learn something, make new friendship, right. um, and that's also the networking I like. That's awesome. CJ, thanks for talking thank to us you. and congratulations. Thank you, thank you, okay. Thank you guys. Okay. That's it for this episode of the Comics Beer and Sci Fi Podcast. Thank you for listening, and we hope you'll join us next time.